Okay, so that was really a great preface to my talk. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the face. And I decided to change it up a little bit this time and talk a little bit about the anatomy that you think about whenever you're think choosing a cosmeceutical. And my goal is to talk about the anatomical approach to cosmeceuticals, the science of skin types, and what ingredients we would use for these different skin types. So first we're going to talk about the epidermis. And the epidermis, of course, prevents water evaporation and keeps allergens out and irritants out and protects your skin. And really, the epidermis is where we spend most of our money on cosmeceuticals because this is where their ingredients really work. So when a patient comes to you and they say, my skin doesn't look radiant, I look old, it's really their epidermis they're complaining about. And that's because the epidermis reflects light off the skin's surface. Is, and so whenever it's very smooth, it'll reflect light better. That's what gives skin its radiance. And most cosmeceutical products really don't go past the epidermis. A few do, like retinol and some others, but most of them only work in the epidermis. So let's look closer at the epidermis and see what we see there. In the epidermis, you have keratinocytes. And I, I'm going to be a little basic because I know that we're not all dermatologists here. So keratinocytes are like bricks in a layer, and we call the top layer of the keratinocytes the stratum corneum. And the keratinocytes are surrounded by this multilamellar bilayer membrane composed of lipids. And if you magnify it, you can see what the lipids look like there. And so they're in between the cells. And these lipids form a coating around the skin cells, and that's what prevents water from evaporating, and that's what prevents irritants from getting in the skin. And you'll see it talk, a lot of times people will talk about it as a brick and mortar structure. Basically the bricks are the keratinocytes and the mortar in the middle are the lipids, but they're talking about the same thing. And this bilayer membrane that we're talking about with, um, that's magnified here is composed mainly of three things, ceramides, fatty acids, and cholesterol. And when you amplify those a little bit, you can see that they all have the similar structure. They have hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. So the hydrophobic tails come together in the middle and they repel water. And this is the whole way that your skin keeps water from evaporating is these hydrophobic tails. And I want you to notice the three-dimensional structure of the bilayer membrane because it's like a puzzle. The pieces have to fit perfectly together or else water is going to get through. And we forget that sometimes when we look for ceramides on the label <clears throat> or we look for cholesterol on the label. It, studies actually show that if you only put one component on the skin, you worsen the skin barrier. You have to put all three of those components and you have to put them in the proper ratio because it's a puzzle and the pieces have to fit together properly. This kind of shows you what the puzzle looks like. And these, um, whenever the barrier is intact, water cannot get through because that yellow area is the hydrophobic area. But look in the black and white section, you see the cholesterol is a little bit of a different shape than the ceramides and the fatty acids. So it's crucial to have the right amount of each one of them. So let's talk about detergents for a minute because that affects our barrier really more than anything except moisturizers. So when you're thinking about dry skin, you have to worry about cleansers and moisturizers. So we're gonna review detergents a little bit. They're made of surfactants. This is what causes foaming. It's in shampoos and dishwashing liquid and also cleansers. And the detergents or the surfactants also have the same heads and tails with the hydrophobic tails, and they have a tendency to form circles. So the detergents pry themselves in between the lipids, and this damages the cell membrane. So you see over on the right, the, here are the detergents coming in, prying themselves in, and they make a hole, and then water starts to evaporate. And that is exactly what happens when you have skin, when you have a barrier that's impaired, such as an eczema. That's a good example of a problem with impaired barrier. So what's the problem that your patient comes in with? They come in with dry skin, it's dull, rough, scaled, poor light reflection, they're itching, they have inflammation, and they have fine lines, what do you do? You give them a non-foaming cleanser that's going to protect their barrier, and you give them a barrier repair moisturizer. Those are the only two products, and it'll make a huge difference. Okay, now we're going to go a little deeper, and we're going to talk about the dermis. What does the dermis do? It gives skin your thickness and strength. 
that's where your collagen, elastin, and hyaluronic acid are. And wrinkles are caused here. And we saw a great lecture from Daniel earlier today. I loved it. That, that it's really the papillary dermis where we're seeing changes. I didn't know that. Thanks for telling me that. So we're going to look at the dermis a little bit <clears throat> up close. And let's look at the fibroblasts. So the fibroblasts are the cell type in the dermis. <clears throat> And they make the collagen, hyaluronic acid, and elastin. So they're like the factories. So think of them as the factories that make other things. And if you saw my brief talk this morning, you know that the factories need an engine to drive them. So the mitochondria in the, in the fibroblasts are very important because they are the engines that drive these factories. And when we look up close at a healthy dermis, you can see the collagen, which is the little blue H's. Elastin are the little purple springs, and then collagen is the brown scaffolding, because collagen gives you the strength and the structure to your skin. So what's the problem? The patient comes to you with wrinkled skin. Of course, we can give them fillers and toxins and things like that, but for topically, what do we do? Well, first we have to think about what, we've, what happens in wrinkles, we've lost elastin, we've lost collagen, we've lost HA, we have reduced vascularity, and the dermal epidermal junction changes. So we need to worry about that. So environmentally, it's really the sun, DNA damage, free radicals, glycation, and mitochondrial damage that, that cause this problem with the dermis. So of course, to prevent aging, we wanna try to block as many of those steps as we can. So what's our solution for wrinkled skin? <laughs> I heard someone say nothing. There's actually stuff. Um, prevention of wrinkles, sunscreen. So the sunscreen blocks the ones I have labeled here in orange. Of course it blocks, when well, we're talking about preventing wrinkles. Of course it's going to block the sun exposure. Sunscreen will block the DNA damage and will block free radicals. And people forget, I live in Miami, and of course we're better about sunscreen there because the sun is such a problem. But no matter where you live, you need to wear an SPF of five every day. They've done a really nice study showing that if you wear an SPF of five every day, by the time you're 70, you've had 50% less sun exposure. So a little bit of sunscreen is important, and I always um, give it to my patients as their moisturizer. And that way they're, they have to put it on because they feel dry without it. Preventing also possibly antioxidants. This is controversial because there, we believe um, it's true, but there's really only basic science data. I believe it's true. I'm a huge antioxidant fan. <clears throat> and it blocks all, um, all of these steps. You see in green, antioxidants do block all these steps. They just haven't been able to prove it prevents aging because if you think about what you'd have to do, they actually haven't proven sunscreen treats aging either. You'd have to take identical twins and give one sunscreen and the other not and control for diet and sun exposure and pollution and cigarette smoke, and it's just really hard to do that. So that's why there's no absolute proof, although there's a lot of good basic science proof to back this up. Okay, ret retinoids. There we've got some good proof, and you saw a lot of that this morning. Um, retinoids to help treat wrinkles. They're really the only thing that treats wrinkles. I want to point out antioxidants prevent them. They don't treat them. Retinoids treat wrinkles. And, but they do it by blocking elastin loss, increasing collagen production, increasing hyaluronic acid production, improving the vascularity, and improving the dermal epidermal junction. So retinoids are the gold standard for treatment of wrinkles. Vitamin C is definitely gets an honorable mention because it absolutely increases collagen production. Lots of good data on that. So what do you do to prevent and treat wrinkles? Sunscreen every day, antioxidants, a vitamin C, and a retinoid. Okay, now we're going to go to the hair follicle. The hair follicle is kind of friend or foe. And it, um, the keratinization process of the hair follicle, the sebum production that happens in the hair follicle from the sebaceous gland, and the presence of P. acnes all make the hair follicle um, cause problems for us. Or it can be good or bad. And the hair follicle is really where you get oily skin and acne from. And the reason you get oily skin in the hair follicle is that yellow gland is a sebaceous gland. That's where sebum is made. 
So a patient comes in with oily skin, they have increased sebum, they can get comedones, they have large pores, unwanted shine. Um, sounds superficial to those of us who don't have oily skin, but for those who do, who have to wash their face three or four times a day and are embarrassed by the shininess, it can be a big problem. So what's the solution? I already taught you surfactants. They want foaming cleansers. These are the people that really need to feel clean. A cleanser for an oily person is opposite of a cleanser for a dry person. Very oily types really shouldn't even use cream moisturizers. Serums and gels are a better choice. And remember, everybody feels dry after they wash their face because it takes your sebaceous gland 30 to 45 minutes to start to produce sebum again. So oily types make the mistake of washing their face and then putting on a cream right away when if they just waited 30 minutes, they would make their own moisturizer. Next problem, acne. Um, with acne, you get disordered keratinization. That means the cells don't exfoliate properly. You get increased sebum. Um, there's different types of fatty acid in the sebum of people with acne, and that's probably genetic, probably diet. And then you get increased P. acne's bacteria. So what's the solution for acne? There's lots of them. We had, you've seen lots of lectures on this today, but retinoids are very important because they stabilize keratinization, they're comedolytic, and they affect the toll-like receptors. Oral contraceptives will stabilize hormones and decrease sebum production. Sorry, I have jet lag, I'm so dehydrated. And um, there was a good article, a CME in the Blue Journal recently, that followed acne patients long-term and found that people on oral contraceptives actually do better long-term than people on antibiotics. I thought that was interesting. Um, salicylic acid will penetrate through sebum. It's um, unlike glycolic that won't. Salicylic will get into the sebum and clean out the pores. And don't forget salicylic acid is in the aspirin family, so it's anti-inflammatory. Of course, antimicrobials. And don't forget your anti-inflammatory ingredients for acne. They make a big difference as well. Some of my patients take supplements like board seed oil and flaxseed oil and things by mouth as well because linoleic acid is a great anti-inflammatory. OK, now we're going to talk about the vasculature. The vasculature brings oxygen and nutrients to your skin. But if the vessels become leaky, it can cause edema and puffiness. And when the vessels dilate, redness occurs. So the leakiness is um, from histamine, and that causes that puffiness, and dilation is redness. And of course, redness is seen in many different sensitive types with many different kinds of inflammation, and one of them is rosacea. And you'll be seeing a, a great lecture on rosacea later on in the session today. So rosacea is mainly caused by inflammation and vascular dilation. So what's our solution for rosacea? Anti-inflammatory ingredients, of course. And also, there's, I'm not going to talk more about rosacea because there's a whole talk dedicated to that. Now we're going to go to the melanocyte, the pesky little melanocyte. Now it gets stimulated. It, the tyrosinase makes melanin, puts it in melanosomes. It goes through the PAR2 receptor. And then the melanosomes accumulate in your keratinocytes. This is made to protect us from the sun and prevent DNA damage because the melanin surrounds the, the chromatin material and protects your DNA. But it can end up causing problems with aging and with melasma. So what makes the melanocytes make melanin? Sun, hormones. Don't forget heat. People forget about heat. Lasers and light will do it. I cannot tell you how many patients have come to me from around the world. I'm in Miami. I've had people come from as far as Dubai and Asia who had fraxel laser for their melasma, and it got worse. So I am not a fan of any kind of heat devices on people with melasma. Um, inflammation will also do it. So what kind of ingredients do you choose for pigment problems? Of course, tyrosinase inhibitors. That's really the mainstay of treatment. Um, hydroquinone is a tyrosinase inhibitor. You've got your PAR2 blockers. Right now, you really only have soy proteins and niacinamide. You have to mention sunscreen. Don't forget anti-inflammatory. Even vitamins can help you and exfoliating ingredients. So you choose one, in my opinion, from each category. You have to hit that melanocyte at all the different areas. So I, when I'm choosing products for my patients, I pick one from each category. So what I do in my practice, and we're um, doing this in practices across the US, is I figure out, that I give the patient a quiz, I figure out what their skin type is, and I've divided people into 16 different skin types 
based on the science I just showed you, and I've already pre-figured out what the regimen is going to be. So for example, this person is a dry, sensitive, not pigmented, wrinkle-prone person, so I would have a special regimen for them. So it's already figured out. It's really fast in the office because they take a quiz. Um, and then we um, have a store, and on the shelves are the different skin types, and the patients shop by the skin types. And so I'm showing you some before and after pictures of stores around the country. So this is how someone sold products before, and this is after by the skin typing system, um, before and after. And it intrigues the patient, makes them want to take the quiz, and then they take the quiz and they find out what their product is. And this is, I don't have my own brand. I always like to make a point because everyone keeps coming up to me and saying, congratulations on your skincare line. I do not have a skincare line. It's a store that we, um, we have 300 different brands in the store. It's a way to shop. It's a way to figure out patient skin type. So my goal today was to approach the skin from an anatomical pr approach and talk about the science of skin types and go through some ingredients and show you how I've done this in my practice. And I'd be happy to answer questions. And also, if you look at stsfranchise.com, you can see more about what we're doing. Thank you so much. Oh.